hand it over to Lee. Uh, Lee's, Lee's the main man uh, tonight, so sometimes we like trade off on, on different things. Uh, he did a lot of stuff. Um, he also runs a different a different meetup on containers, uh, containers, microservices, and stuff like that. But uh, Lee went to DockerCon and kind of like got the gist and uh, everything going on over there. So take it away. Thank you, Karthik. Oh. And thank you, Everett, for uh, this evening's food. I think it's it's not just Rackspace, but Everett specifically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, uh, great. Hey, yeah, hey, it's good to be in front of you guys again. Uh, a lot of familiar faces, and also not a lot of familiar faces. So, um, Mark, thanks for your enthusiasm earlier. Just like, let's mingle, let's do this. Yeah, <laughs> let's meet up. Let's do. Uh, good to see some of you guys here for the first time. Actually, um, uh, Pradeep asked a great question earlier about, um, hey, getting into container land. What's a good couple of books, or what's a good book to go out and, and get? And I had just noted one of the first ones that I'd picked up, which was um, from James Turnbull. Um, he was previously of uh, Puppet. Um, he was an advisor at Docker. I don't know that he still is, but he's doing his thing at Firestarter. He's got a cheap ebook. I think it's like 14 bucks. It's called The Docker Book for those that are... And he, he tends to... What's nice is you buy it once, and, and he updates kind of with each release, and you can just download the new version. So it's kind of nice. Um, so there's a tip. And then are we... Uh, we're all we're all recording, so GK, if you could uh, just keep it down back there while we record, I'm just uh... nice. Okay, well that's how you guys can reach me. Um, so Karthik went through a few announcements. Some um, Raphael and actually Raphael and I spoke um, earlier this week. Uh, the position that he described is just it's a playground for anybody that's into these technologies. So you definitely want to talk to Raphael. It's a uh... Uh, another thing I want to talk about is just upcoming um, conferences. <clears throat> Who's going to Linux Fest, Texas Linux Fest tomorrow? Yes, sir. Yeah, we do, James. Very good. If you guys see me there, I'll, or see me there, I'll be behind the um, O'Reilly table, handing out a bunch of books, probably, and doing some raffling for uh, uh, free conference passes. So come and heckle me and throw tomatoes. Uh, also, if you go to ChefConf, anybody going to ChefConf? Nobody, no, no cookers in the room, no, no recipe people. All right. Well, if you do go, I'll be doing um, a bunch of podcasts with uh, the new stack. Uh, so again, uh, you, you can't get away from me. Uh, also, um, Karthik mentioned another meetup that I organize: um, uh, microservices and containers. Austin, I've seen some of you guys there, and pointing to GK again just to harass him. Um, the next one that we're going to have, it's unannounced, but I'm going to, this is official announcement right now, it's, it's coming up pretty quick, it's July 19th, we're going to host Container Summit. Uh, so it, the, it'll be uh, about a three hour long um, ordeal, um, we're gonna maybe cap it off at about 85 folks, assuming that even that many show. Um, there'll definitely be food and drink. Joint's going to join us, help organize, video everything. We'll have some quality content, hopefully a lot better than this evening's content. Uh, but uh, uh, so I have to—I definitely have to plug that because that's a fantastic, uh, or I hope that it's going to be fantastic. So uh, again, just you'll have to put up with me for a little bit, I think. But you know, that's a great. I'm trying to figure it out. I don't know. Maybe it might be Rackspace. It might be IBM. It might be Forcepoint. Uh, just. A lot of the venues that are come, I've asked, in, inquired about um, Capital Factory. Uh, haven't heard back from them yet. I expect that's a little more spendy than what folks are wanting to do. But so I suspect it'll probably be like from the, the domain on up uh, in terms of location. Uh, so yeah, so this is it right here. Right, plug the hell out of that. Uh, so great. So speaking of meetups, um, like uh, Mark was saying, kind of an interesting um, set of factoids uh, coming out of uh, the Docker's organizers group. There's a whole bunch of these Docker meetups worldwide. There's 253 of them total. So um, Austin is just one of many. And there's a lot of members that have signed up. Obviously not that many people, not everyone who's a, mem a member goes to every meetup. But I thought I'd point this out because it's kind of kind of neat. Um, Austin's on the map in the North American region, number eight here, a little over a thousand members. So, kind of cool. We've been and we've been doing this for a while. Uh, Karthik has been doing this a lot longer than I have, and so has um, Everett. So, did you, David? You ask a question, or no? Okay. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, and I don't know. It kind of goes off the chart with uh, the folks that are in over the 3,000s, but yeah. Bangalore is doing pretty well. Nitin Agarwal is the guy who leads that. So he, uh, he's pretty, he's, he's quite the evangelist. Um, who was here for the Docker birthday party we had a little while ago? Yeah, very good, yeah. And those are some of the familiar faces I'm talking about. Okay, good. Well, anyway, factoids on that. I, I enjoyed the party. Um, it was kind of nice to get, uh, have something that was like really hands-on. Um, and some of you guys were helped doing some instruction with those hands-on, so that's nice. Well, I'm going to go through, uh, so I wasn't the only one at DockerCon. Um, we just had the, the other meetup that I referred to, we just had one of those, um, where we had Prometheus and Aquasec come and, and demonstrate and kind of talk, talk to some things. Anyway, we talked a little bit about DockerCon there. There were some people that had gone. Ian also went, and he's going to talk to you guys later, demo, um, swarm to you guys. Uh, hey, nice, uh, Nice event. I was at um, DockerCon EU, which was out in Barcelona previously. There was about 1,500 attendees out at, in Barcelona. Here in the U.S., up in Seattle, um, about 3,000 attendees. Um, many folks got to go up uh, to the Space Needle for free, which was a pretty cool uh, deal. Uh, so the themes, there were about... This was a really significant really, you know, conference slash release. The, the things that were heralded at this release were all about Docker 112, which is like, hasn't released yet, right? It's, we're like this close to it coming out. So, uh, anyway, the, the themes were, the first one was about developer experience and the notion that the folks at Docker try to make things really simple, out of the box, uh, batteries included. Um, eliminate friction. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, operators that focus on Docker and containers, and not necessarily as many developers are necessarily. Uh, you know, just the way in which this portability and the way in which um, you can wrap applications and, and other things inside of containers really speaks to the ops end of it very well and resonates strongly. Also, certainly with developers, um, that was actually kind of a, I'd seen a. A quick survey done by show of hands um, in a couple of rooms about who, who sort of identified on one end, you know, dev versus ops, and it tended to be you know more ops each time. I don't know what's going on with the camera or with the slides, but anyway, um, they're trying to simplify the tools, and they say that the best tools should get out of your way. You really, you know, they should just be there for you. They should adapt to you. You shouldn't have to adapt to them. Um, uh, the point here being is that. There has been in beta for some time um, a much more native integration and way of running Docker on Mac and Docker on Windows. Who's been who's participated in the beta for that stuff? Most of you guys. Yeah, nice. Okay. Uh, so the beta label is essentially coming off. There were about seventy thousand beta testers, and so um, you know, so yay, uh, beta is almost done. As soon as one twelve, uh, I'm sorry the. The, the beta previously was closed. Uh, it's now open for anybody. So if you guys don't have it, go get it. Um, they, they talked about the notion that, you know, c coming in to create the Docker for Windows, Docker for Mac, the, what, what lies under the covers looks really rather f similar, um, in terms of the, the individual components that, that make, that, that make these up and deliver them. Um, a lot of the, the, some of the folks that they, Docker had acquired um, that were focused on unikernels have, have helped in building out these capabilities. Uh, so essentially, yeah, it's a public beta. Anybody can go get it. You don't have to wait for your key. It's really nice. I'm going to probably show you guys a little bit of that here in a second. Um, the, so if you're not unfamiliar, um, as you use, I'm going to talk about Docker for Mac since that's Sort of what, what I, where, that's, that's where my head's at. But I think a lot of this is the same across the, the, the two. The VM, you still run a VM. In this case, um, whereas you were, were running kind of Docker machine in like a virtual box VM before, you're now running, um, an Alpine Linux VM, uh, called Moby. Um, is that sort of the name they've given it? Um, but running on, on the Mac on XHive, which is, uh, Something of a, a, a an OSX native um, hypervisor system. Um, in Windows, it's on Hyper V. Uh, I'm not, you know, 
Do, does anybody know, is there a specific version of Windows that they're using for Docker for Windows? 10, very good, okay. So, I'm, you guys aren't the only people learning today. Good. Uh, so one one of the neat things about Mobi or about the, these VMs is that um, they are set to uh, reset every time you restart the VM. So if you're in there mucking with it and screw something up, you just restart it. And for the most part, it'll reset. It's a little more complicated than that. I think there's some specific configurations that you can tell to persist beyond you know, reboots. But in general, uh, that's the theme. Um, on that... Uh, you know, there's a few times where, you know, you, you do need to get at the VM and you do want to run some things on that host. Maybe it's applying an app armor profile or, 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 you know, or whatever you need to do. Uh, as I've understood it, there's about three ways to get in and, and, uh, get at, get on the VM. One way is to screen in. Um, the other way is to, you know, a couple different ways to run, um, other containers that can help you get into, get into that VM. So I'm going to, let's see if I can't maybe single-handedly demo some of this. So um, this is familiar to the vast majority of you guys. Uh, there's, uh, there's the whale up there. It's running. Um, we can go in and interact with the VM. I'm just going to demonstrate that there's kind of a difference between these two modes. Um, this first one around um, screen, so you don't I, don't, I don't think you saw me paste it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Everett. So I'm not sure, my terminal is a little bit off. Maybe I'll just try to start this up again. Anyway, if we take the first, if we go to screen into the VM, um, you'll end up getting presented a prompt to um, log in. I apologize, it's not. Uh, I think each time I go to each time I go to increase the font, I think it's starting to. Uh, all right. Anyway, I'm pasting the screen command. You hit enter. Unfortunately, it, it should be looking like a whale saying, hey, welcome, and presenting you with a, a user prompt. Um, anyway, the username is root, uh, and there is no password. So uh, I don't know how publicized that is. But it's, um, the other one is, and maybe I won't demonstrate this, but anyway, you just go and run a, um, run a, a privileged container host, or um, con a privileged container, rather, and then you are uh, dropped in. And so you don't need to log in. You're already on the uh, VM. You're inside Mobi. OK, well, anyway, that was really critical to me during a couple of things I was trying to do um, on the host itself. So um, I'll, the, the slides will be available so in case anybody actually wants those commands. So um, the second area, and this is probably where we're going to spend a lot of, more of our time, or the most of our time, is on orchestration. So 112 was. Um, you know, it's a dot release. They're going from 1.11 to 1.12, but it's significant. It's um, arguably um, the most, I don't know, the biggest release that, that Docker has had since they first GA'd the 1.0. Um, what's happening here is the inclusion of Docker Swarm into the Docker engine. Um, so from Docker's perspective, the best way to orchestrate Docker is using Docker, not necessarily Kubernetes, Mesos, Marathon, Nomad, other things. Uh, so there's a lot of, um, uh, I'll, maybe I'll just say it once, there's uh, some political ramifications to you know, the choice to include Swarm into the engine. We'll leave it at that. Uh, but let's talk about <clears throat> what does that mean now that Swarm's inside there. It's, it's, uh, Swarm is now you know, in the engine, um, but that also comes with a couple of new constructs. One of those constructs is this is a service. Another one is the node. So as you go to do, you, know, you go to in interface with the Docker API, maybe over the CLI, and you do like Docker run or Docker, uh, you, now you can do Docker service, maybe Docker service list, Docker service create, Docker node, and do a Docker node list. Um, there's So there's these new first class citizens inside of the you know, the, the architectural world of, of Docker. 
part of what was delivered in 112 is cryptographic node identity. So I just um, did a podcast on Monday with Nathan McCauley. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with him. He's a director of security at um, Docker. We talked a lot about cryptographic node identity, but also just security across Docker in general. And um, one, one of the things that's just, there's a couple things that are happening in, in here. And one is the notion that every node gets a unique ID. It gets a, 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 a unique key created to identify that node uniquely across, across the environment. And actually, nodes aren't the only thing that get unique IDs. Users, all of you guys who signed up for Docker Hub, you've got a, a login account, you've got a unique ID there. These nodes do as well. Other things that have unique IDs are images. As you've, as you've gone to, well, and images and also run, running instances, right? They all get IDs. And those IDs become really important in terms of security. A lot of, yeah. Yes. So the question was, do you, is, hey, is, does node mean host? Uh, yes. So, um, so we're going to talk about routing mesh uh, and service API. Ian's going to demonstrate some of this stuff, but I, uh, you know, just kind of, just kind of, again, to note that this is like this is a very significant release, um, and this is kind of architecturally what that begins to look like. Now, what's all inside the engine um, is a number of new things. Um, um, swarm mode, you know, so swarm is now in there. Whether you're running the node or the host in swarm mode. I'm sorry, manager mode or worker mode. Um, and it's just the weirdest thing um, ever. I don't know what. Uh, also, then, there's a, some significant improvements around networking, the inclusion of load balancing. We're going to talk about that. Um, load balancing using IPVS, which has been in the Linux kernel since 2.0, uh, something that I had some experience with about 10 years ago, I think. Uh, there's also a certificate authority that's now included. So it's really PKI that's happening inside of um, swarm mode. Um, and that's all handled kind of behind the scenes. They've, they've really uh, made it secure by default in that sense. So swarm mode is, uh, well, uh, I'll say this, that if, if any of you have been using swarm for some time, all of what you've done is going to continue to work as you go to upgrade. Um, in the future, as you go to initiate, instantiate new clusters, you can do so um, using the built-in um, swarm into the engine now. Uh, so they are a number of new things have come out with um, with swarm mode, um, rebalancing of nodes, um, so self-organizing, some self-healing. Um, there's no more external uh, key value store that's required. It used to be that you had to plug in one of the most popular three. Uh, turns out that. Uh, Docker went ahead and did their own Raft implementation inside of Docker Engine. They took that Raft implementation from etcd and put it in. So, uh, yep, uh, no single points of failure. You know, because of that, uh, I don't know what's. Uh, this is really annoying. Is anybody else annoyed by the flickering? Yeah. Let's just let's try it with. Okay, so we were just saying that there's now a, a certificate authority built into the engine, and that public key infrastructure uh, is what helps provide the cryptographic node identity. Um, so it's government grade, it's secure by default, it's end-to-end -end TLS. These keys are, uh, these certificates are generated on your behalf as you go to join nodes to the cluster. Um, the communication between them is, you know, encrypted using TLS. The, there's automated key rotation that happens. Uh, by default, every three months, uh, the keys are swapped out. That's certainly configurable. Um, and you can choose to revoke a node from the cluster at any time if you want to. Uh, at this point, I can only think it's my laptop. I don't know what to. Um, oh, okay. 
Well, good. well, this makes it fun. All right, so <laughs> um, uh, how many of you guys are familiar with the uh, Center for Internet Security? Uh, oh, all right, yeah, very good, okay. Yeah, um, I've written on, I've, I'm, so I'm part of that uh, um, standards body, if you can call it that. I think you can call them that. They end up putting out a bunch of benchmarks on various technologies in and around security, and so they put out a Docker benchmark um, quite some time ago that just says, here's a checklist of things that you want to do to make sure that you're running Docker securely. And with each and every release, uh, that gets updated. And so I am j- had just been kind of active with um, the next version, the, the unpublished version of what will come next for uh, Docker 1.12. And so you know a lot of it's sort of in and around Swarm um, and some suggestions on what to do and what not to do in terms of 1.12. So this isn't published just yet, uh, but uh, maybe a couple I'll call out here, and I think Ian will even maybe show you some of these. Um, there are... And, and and Everett was noting this earlier, but there's as you go to you know create your first node and you, you maybe set that as your manager. Um, as you go to bring up another node and have it join that cluster, um, you can set a passphrase. Uh, you can create a passphrase and make sure that anyone who wants to join has to present that passphrase. Well, that's not necessarily set by default, uh, and so you need to go set it. And anyway, there's just a couple a couple of caveats to to note to make sure your environment's secure. So the Docker, I said Docker service is now this new construct. So previously when you're running, um, really if you're running applications using Docker alone and just Docker software, you're probably likely to find that not all of your applications needs are met. A lot of applications need um, load balancing between them. Uh, maybe you're running a, a series of web hosts and, or you know, rest endpoints that need load balancing between them and, and the way in which you know, you need to bring in third-party software to help um, deliver those types of services. Well, that's no longer with 1.12. Um, you can go out and describe a service, how many replicas of that service you'd like to have up. Um, and as you go to do that and create the service, uh, a virtual IP address is created. Um, so that IPVS that we mentioned earlier uh, is created and used to uh, have load balancing out of the box. Load balancing is kind of behind the scenes with Docker service. Yeah, David. Yes, yeah. Um, I want to digress and answer that question more fully. So um, David had the unfortunate um, <laughs> uh, experience of listening to one of my uh, a previous talk that I'd given at a different uh, meetup, and I started to describe the difference between an application container and, at the time, I called it an infrastructure container. And I think I think I'll use a different term and call it a machine container. And and the way in which and I think I've even got a much better description of this now because I've been studying um, LexD uh, a bit. Um, so an application container is conceptually pretty small, probably singularly purposed, probably something that you just never SSH into. And it's intended to do one thing, maybe, and that's it. Whereas like a machine container or an infrastructure container, um, and really technologies like LexD, LXD, if you guys have come, in, come to that, it's from Canonical, um, built into Ubuntu now, is um, it really intended to run longer living um, system containers, machine containers, that are, in fact, more of a full Linux system that you would SSH into and kind of do things inside of. And so uh, there's a little bit of a just nomenclature uh, clarification there. Uh, and then to David's question about, like, hey, is Docker stepping into and really beginning to focus on application needs? Yes, absolutely. That's all, kind of all what this is about. One of the things that they brought here is the notion that you need to scale apps, the notion, too, that you need to, that your apps and their code change over time. And so there's the ability to perform rolling updates on, you know, moving your app from one version of code to the or one version of that image, really, to the next, and having some control over that. And Ian's going to show you some of that. You know, I don't know that that is. This is really building upon things that were already in Docker Swarm um, previously. Um, so some of the way in which these things get, you, there's some new constructs for, for sure, but there are also some some scheduling strategies and constraints and filters that are built upon what was there before. Um, yes, the scheduler is um, overall supposed to be um, pluggable. Um, and certainly as you go to have, uh, certainly you don't necessarily need to turn on Swarm. You can use Kubernetes, for example, to and its scheduling to schedule your Docker containers. 
Um, so. Uh, Ian, did, it's a great. So the question is, um, hey, uh, d as I do go to do a rolling upgrade, um, if I've got maybe 50 containers that are running one version of my software, and maybe I just want to do like a canary or a blue green deployment, and maybe is where you're going is like, hey, I just want to put out update like five of those 50, see where things are at, see if I want to go forward, uh, maybe even have automated rollback. Um, you know, I don't. Of what I've seen, I don't think that there's, there's that level of granular control, um, and if. For those of you guys who have heard me talk on container orchestrators before, uh, Swarm is just, it's a younger than the other. It is just not as advanced. So it's a, yeah, I, don't, I haven't heard that, that use case being satisfied. I just, so hopefully none of the Docker folks are watching this recording. So just, but, uh, but anyway, it's just the truth. And they're moving very fast. They, they really are. They've uh, actually, I think with the 112 release, undone much of what I'd written up and spoke to before. So, um, you know, kudos to the team. A little bit about uh, that IPVS and this load balancing. By the way, IPVS, um, if I recollect, is um, IP virtual server, uh, which is about creating virtual IP addresses, VIPs, and, and balancing between them. Um, they've got basically this construct of uh, a routing mesh, um, really kind of a neat concept that I'd like to see some performance analysis done around. But this concept of the notion that uh, you can have you know, a number of hosts, maybe 10, and maybe you've got three containers that you'd like to load balance between. Well, you can use the load balancing that's built in now to do that. But maybe that initial request for that's supposed to go to one of your three containers, uh, which are on the first three hosts, maybe that request goes to like the 10th host. They've built in this routing mesh to say, that's OK. That 10th host will accept it look up where it needs to actually go and route your traffic over to to really like a very highly fault tolerant configuration. There's got to be some amount of overhead for that, but that's a pretty pretty cool deal. Somebody brought that up in one of the talks what the overhead problems that was. I believe the engineer said that because they were using an external based system that is extremely low and very fast, I don't know what they were concerned about. Nice. Okay. Did everybody yeah. So that uh and they I know they um yeah. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, Everett, I thought you were just telling me to hurry up and move along. Uh, so, great question. Or So, Ian chimed in a second ago and had said that, uh, um, you know, the question around performance had come up, the performance in terms of the routing mesh, and that, you know, I'm not sure who the speakers were. I spoke with Jana and uh, Madhu um, privately about, uh, some of this networking. Uh, anyway, I think that they're pretty confident that being that IPVS and some of that routing mesh um, technology is in the Linux kernel, the overhead is nominal. And so they weren't really concerned with it. But then the other question here was, uh, hit me again. Yeah, this is a great question. So um, I intend to give another talk fully on just deep diving on container networking. And there's a lot, of, a number of plugins. Um, I, uh, I uh, it, so the question again, I'm sorry, geez, I don't even think I repeated it, which is, hey, how does, how do these new capabilities interface with networking plugins? So you can, you know, you, you can use the default, the native, um, Docker drivers, uh, which provide, uh, host connectivity or a bridge connectivity or no networking at all or overlay using VXLAN. Um, you can also plug in a bunch of other drivers uh, from third parties. In 1.12, um, they're coming out with uh, support for Mac VLAN and IP VLAN, which are going to be great for brownfielding exercises in existing data centers. But to your question, um, yep, my understanding is that those drivers are all still very pluggable. That these, like the this service construct, if you were to run Docker service create and 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 have load balancing instantiated, that it's the expectation that that request would get passed off to the driver. That that my understanding is that they've and what, from what I've seen from Docker, it's been pluggable through and through. So right now, right now in like one eleven, if you go and request a new network, um, there's kind of two parts to that request. One is cr the creation of the network, the subnet, some of the, the 
the network stack that, that belongs to the container, and then also um, IP address management, IPAM. And, and so and, and they're both pluggable, and bo both of those requests get handed off to the plugin. So in terms of handing off a load balancing request, I got to imagine that that's, they just hand off that request to the plugin. I haven't seen it, though. Okay, so they, uh, that would have been a, people would have balked pretty quick then, I expect. Um, let's let's uh, walk through maybe some, you know, some other slides on the topic. Um, I think this, these, this visualization is going to help. Let me go back. All right. Swarm mode. So I'm going to go through some slides. Ian's going to hopefully hit it home later with actual demo. How do you get Swarm up and going? Um, so you start with a node. You start with one, one host. Um, on that host, you, go, you give it the command docker swarm init. That initializes that, uh, that node as a, essentially as a, a, a manager. Um, then you go to your second node, and you um, point it to your first manager. So you start to get some, you start to point nodes at one another. Um, they go through some leader election to make sure that there's always uh, a quorum of managers available. As you go to create new services, in this case, I think the example is about Redis, if I, or just some front end web server, you want three replicas of them. Um, you know, maybe two of them land on one node and another one lands on, on the other node. Um, And in this case, maybe that front end leverages Redis. So you create a service for that. Uh, maybe a node fails. And this is, um, I believe, this is new as of 112 as well. The notion that there's, um, rescheduling and load balancing, uh, uh, coming in. So, you know, the, the cluster acknowledges that's not the desired state, goes out, reschedules the, um, Containers. You can also scale them. Um, simple command Docker service scale, the name of your service, and, you know, how many you want. So, um, by default, the scheduling strategy that's used there is spread, meaning as you go to scale them up, the default strategy just says evenly, evenly distribute containers across the full cluster. There are other strategies that can be used, like bin pack, to say, no, 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 uh, just load this first one up as much as you absolutely can until it spills over, and then spill over to the next one, load it up and spill over to the next one. And we want, there's a bunch of philosophy around why you'd use one versus the next, and um, those. I have. Um, and, uh, you know, more to that, um, uh, as you go to satisfy your needs there, you often end up not only selecting your strategy, that, that strategy, by the way, is just selected when you start the Docker daemon. Um, you, you likely end up needing to step into constraints and filters to, you know, sort of the canonical example here being, hey, maybe these first two hosts have SSD in them, whereas these, these other two just have disks, much slower. So, hey, I want my, I don't know, my MySQL or what I, I don't know, you know, I, I want certain containers scheduled in certain spots and so you're able to define those strengths. You're able to label these two nodes as with whatever key, key value pair you want to use. In that case, maybe SSD. Um, and then as you go to schedule them, you just put that constraint on there that says, you know, please go and, you know, Docker run, go schedule this, uh, but with that constraint that it has to be on. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, so then there's also this notion of, and I think that, you know, just to be fair to everybody else that's in the space, I think this is a very early capability coming out from Docker. It's the notion of a global service. So, and this is pretty cool that they, I, these, this isn't my slide, by the way. These aren't my slides. So just, I don't, I don't, these are, these are Docker slides. I'm not taking credit. Uh, but I think it's kind of neat that they use the example of Prometheus. So it was, yeah, any, anybody was at the last meetup, the microservices and containers also, and yeah, we had, uh, yeah, that's right. We had uh, Brian Brazil himself here from uh, Ireland, actually from Dublin. He came out to present. Did a good job. He's uh, one of the core maintainers of Prometheus. It's a time series monitoring tool, really all intended about this space. It's a great tool. Free, you guys should go use it. Uh, 
Anyway, point being funny that they, they listed this because what they're showing here is that if you want to schedule a global service, a global service says, I've got some, conta some container that I want to run on every single node. Every single node should have this container. Um, schedulers like Kubernetes have got probably more powerful ways of describe doing those same things. Um, uh, that said, like I said, the, the Docker folks are moving really fast. I think they'll have a lot, you know, unless I'm just not aware of some other options they have here, because it's often not just the case that like, sometimes it's, hey, I want this container on every node. Other times it's like, well, no, no, I want this container on every node that is running kernel version such and such, or what, it, it gets, a, you know, there's, there's a lot more conditions to that. You know, I don't, uh, I haven't seen it in, maybe I'm just not as knowledgeable on this, but I just haven't seen that. Like in general, using some of those constraints we were talking about, I think you can, but I don't know how much of that is exposed through the, serv the service command here, so. Does anybody, anybody know? Anybody? Okay. okay. Uh, but so speaking of constraints, hey, <laughs> I just gave the same example. Um, here's sort of, you know, the example written out. Maybe you're taking and labeling a certain node as having SSD in this case, and you just made up the, the key and you put in whatever value you wanted. Later, as you go to run that container, you know, in this case, they label these two engines or th those two nodes as having SSDs, and then you add that constraint to it. So, you know, this example probably, you know, David gives me hope about being able to add constraints like to the global. Um, you, uh, yes, th these you are. Yeah. Yeah, and also not quite what you'd hope for, right? But. Well, the example like really lends your mind to that, but that's just an example. Like, what if it's uh, yeah. what if it's wherever David's logged into? Don't run any sensitive, uh, you know, data. I mean, you know, the example they use makes you feel warm and fuzzy with that, but uh, you know. It's probably, yeah, it's intended to represent the manager. Um, it's probably, you know, a little bit, a bit misleading. Most of the time you'd have a quorum of at least like three man, like in any decent sized cluster, you'd have like, you know, three managers that have, are maintaining that, that quorum. One that's the active manager, the other two that are standby and just waiting for the first guy to, to croak. Um, it, you know, it is possible to have this guy running workloads as well. I think in these slides it just, you know, weren't. Uh, three based on on raft really, and raft is kind of based on uh, cap theorem and and uh, uh, so yeah, just playing out that constraint. Um, anyway, we'll we'll kind of speed this up. I think you guys get the point of that. Um, also, I'm gonna save um, a little bit of the routing mesh for a different talk. I'm just I'm not gonna do it um, justice. Uh, these slides are available though if you guys want to go through them. There is one thing um, that also back to what David had said before about Docker getting towards um, applications and the needs that you have for applications is the ability now to perform a health check. To define a health check uh, for, the, for your containers and in this case, you know, like execute a remote script that's supposed to return a certain value and uh, this is fantastic. This is much anticipated. This is great. You know, I think there's uh, e e twofold. Um, yes is the answer. So, sorry, the question was, is this tied to the Docker file? Can you define a health check in your Docker file? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, you can also define it uh, on the at runtime. So Docker run, such and such, health check. Either way. You, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I don't know. Yeah, so the question was, uh, sorry, can this, hey, can you define health checks at a service level or can you just do it, uh, you know, on, on individual containers? And, you know, I'm not, uh, that's a, does anybody know? I'm not, that's a, my presumption was just sort of the simple, like on an individual container level, but, but, uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Right. Okay. Boy, when's that pizza coming in here? Oh, the pizza is here. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah, good. 
Nice. Okay, good. I've got way more slides than I should have uh, had here. Let's do one other walkthrough. Uh, and I'll see if I can't beat you guys to the pizza. Uh, okay, good. Yeah. So again, just kind of reinforcing some of the same notions. Hey, look, blue does mean manager. Well, what do you know? Uh, host node and engine seem to get interchanged here a little bit. They are host and node are really intended to be congruent the same thing. Engine is a little bit different in that it refers to the Docker daemon and Docker software. Yeah, that's a good point. So, um, I think it's, it, yeah, so the common um, question is like, uh, hey, you know, as I've gone to set up um, swarm clusters, uh, I've ended up with, you know, I've set up three managers, but really only one of which was active, and the other two were just kind of sit, sitting there idle, and they didn't necessarily denote that by color in the slide, but you're absolutely right. I think if they were to take this one step further, as it stands right now, there's, there can really only ever be one active manager. And so there's one, guy, one engine that's performing that scheduling, and the other two are just sitting there with the same state ready to take over. So, yeah. They do. Uh, uh, near as I can, I think we're about to get into that. I'm pretty, I, I don't want to misspeak. I'm pretty sure that that is using the same raft consensus protocol. Um, there's an internal distributed state store raft consensus group. Great, yes. Uh, part of the um, communication that happens between managers and the other nodes, the workers, is using um, Google's uh, gRPC, which is a pretty e efficient protocol. The workers themselves, as they go to um, keep track of one another, maybe even more importantly, exchange some of their neighbor tables, their network neighbor tables, they, uh, the um, Docker network engineers chose to use uh, a gossip protocol for that, which is fairly efficient, has high convergence times. Moreover, they chose to use HashiCorp's um, SURF uh, implementation. Uh, so a little more detail on the consensus protocol. It does hold that desired state. It's strongly consistent here. So they, they really do need to stay um, uh, in... <coughs> stay abreast of, of the actual state of the, the, the cluster. Um, that's probably juxtaposed to the workers themselves that they do need to be aware of one another and they do need to be able to um, perform that routing mesh that we talked be about before. Um, but they're eventually consistent here in terms of how they're using um, the gossip protocol. So, yeah, so, so I think you know, if I got the, the question right, it's, uh, you know, as we're, as we're using the terms um, nodes and workers, and probably better be, managers and workers, rather, is that, yeah, so they're all, they're all nodes, or they're all hosts, um, some of which are specially designated as managers, and they, they do the scheduling and kind of keep track of the cluster, who's up, who's down, who's got what workloads. And then these um, workers, I think the, the question was, um, or maybe I'll just try to answer the question, which was, um, did the, right, we're, yeah, in this case, this is fit like a bare metal machine, but, and or you know, could be a VM. Yep, it's just yeah, binaries installed on the host. On the, yeah. So I'm not sure what to depart or, or convey on this slide um, per se, um, other than we'll get into this much deeper in a different talk, hopefully, assuming Karthik ever lets me present again. 
but uh, uh, actually, I'm just I'm kind of curious. How many of you guys are familiar with the container network model or CNI, the um, the container networking interface? And just and or is anybody interested in like really deep diving on uh, container networking? Good. I enjoyed your Mesos talk, by the way. It was good. Yeah. yeah. Um, good. Okay. We'll, we'll do that. We'll talk about IP IP VLAN and MAC VLAN too. Those are cool. But anyway, the, I don't know that there's really anything cool here other than just try, it's trying to articulate how IPVS works and the routing mesh. And um, all right. Yeah, pizza break sounds good. I'm, I think I'm sucking wind anyway. So good. Okay. Yeah, pizza break. We'll come back, uh, ask more questions, and then get Ian up here. All right. <laughs>